Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I would like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Yes, Holy Spirit, you are certainly welcome in this place. Not only in this sanctuary, but in these souls, each of us opening up to you right now, asking you to not only fill us, but flood us with your presence to overflowing so that we might be those vessels that carry the fragrance, the ever moving, expanding, outflowing presence of the King of glory. May we be those vessels that are recognized wherever we go as servants of the Most High God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for dwelling here with us, for anointing our worship, bringing us to that place, Lord, where we can hear the word of the living God. Now speak to us, I pray. As we've worshiped you, will you now lead us, and we'll receive it with grateful hearts in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Praise God. You can be seated this morning here in God's house if you are in your house. I pray today that it is a house of the Lord for you. And uh, if you were already seated, that's okay. And if you are joining us online, don't forget you can say amen. Uh, of course, you have to type it so that we can hear it. But send it on into us and we'll thank you for it. Well, we are mindful of those even from within our congregation who are waiting test results, who have tested positive, or who are, who are even in the hospital. Uh, I'll mention one in particular, uh, Brother Gary, I'm not, because we're online, not going to say last names, but Brother Gary and Sister Carol are both uh, in need of prayer. She's home and doing okay, but he is hospitalized and needs our prayer. And let's continue to lift them up and all of the others among us you may not know uh, what I know, but we have a number of folks who are in that place and struggling with this, and we certainly are praying together that God will give us victory and breakthrough and healing. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Just a, a challenging time. You know, it's unusual, uh, unprecedented, really, and, and uh, we're going to make it through by the power of God and His help and strength day by day. All right, well, let's go in our Bibles this morning to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I'm going to show you in a few moments some pictures. And we're going to try and have a good time today just focused on the greatness of God and his power and how we see it. So today, I want to, uh, if I have a title, it's Seeing. Seeing. There's so much that is available to us if we can see it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and let's read verses 3 and 4. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Wow, that's pretty direct, isn't it? Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe they are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. If it's hidden, it is only hidden to those who are unbelievers. So now let's look at verse 16. Verse 16. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. Somebody say, glory to God. That's why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small 
glory to God and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we do not look at the troubles we can see now. We don't. They are around us. We know they are there and we peek at them with one eye. But generally, we don't look at the troubles we can see now. We can see them. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. And in those two texts, you have the competing worldviews. There are all kinds of religious worldviews. There are political worldviews. But the only two that matter, from heaven's perspective, you have two worldviews that are competing. The view of the unbeliever and the view of the believer. And now for final clarification, look at chapter 3 and verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Seeing. Notice how much the Holy Spirit talks to us in those three texts about seeing. Those who are unbelievers, have not surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ, are unable to see. They are, as a matter of fact, blind to these things. Those who are are believers can be criticized because even though we can see the things that are around us, that's not where our gaze is fixed. Hallelujah. Because we see something the unbeliever does not see. We have had the veil removed. Amen. A few years ago, I shared a message with you here, and I had preached it in Silver Spring years ago as well, because I'd seen a a scientific report with a couple of images that I just thought were fantastic. So the guys are going to put this first image up for you, and what it was was a look at a single cell from a mouse brain, that's on the left, a mouse brain cell, and then a slide of an artist's rendering of the universe. Uh, because we don't have a picture of the whole universe. So a rendering based on all of the composite pictures coming in from places like or instruments like the Hubble Space Telescope, which I think is very cool. So the article here was a brain cell. You can see it up in the upper left corner. A brain cell is the same as the universe. And I don't have time to show you where this credit comes from. I think the University of Wisconsin was in I see his name on the lower left, Mark Miller, a, a doctoral student at Brandeis University. And so if you want to still look that up, you can. But I, that's not the one. Go to the, this is now today, the latest rendering that we have. And... The human brain. So now we have a picture. Hallelujah. I'm not sure who the volunteer was, but thank the Lord that we... What what keeps jumping out here? Oh, we have a... That's the behind. So that's me walking around? Is that what... What is that? Oh, okay. I got it. The light's on there. It's like, what... So here we go. Look at this. Popular Mechanics, November 17th, 2020. The human brain looks suspiciously like the universe, which may freak you out. But look at this. There are one too many similarities for this to be a coincidence. Come on, let's close in prayer this morning, thanking God for how glorious he is. And let's go home. Amen. Come on. What this? Hey, this is the unbeliever. They're they're blind. They cannot see only the things that are right in front of them. But the more they are instrumentally able to see those things, the more they have to write statements. Can you imagine? Now, this may have been a believer. I don't know, saying, oh, I'm going to write this, and I'm going to try and do it so nobody knows I'm a believer. But can you imagine? Leave it up there. Leave it up there. Leave it up there. Can you imagine the scientists having to write this? There are one too many similarities. So you can find this online, Popular Mechanics. Uh, because nowadays, everything that's, that you used to have to pay for to purchase in magazines and newspapers, the guys who lead the printing industry had this epiphany 20 years ago that why should they get paid for doing all that when they can make it free? 
Now, if you ever go to business school, I hope they teach you that's a horrible concept. It's the way to bankrupt an entire and ruin an entire industry. But nevertheless, they did it. And here we go. You can get it there. There are one too many similarities for this to be a coincidence. To be honest with you, I'm not sure which of those is which. I think the brain cells on the left. But uh, Here are some of the bullet points. An astrophysicist and a neuroscientist teamed up to compare similarities between the universe and networks of neurons in the brain. So my friend, when you look up into the sky at night and you see, the, I, I think I read somewhere, don't quote me on this, but the human eye with no other competing light sources at the best can see a few thousand stars. I, I, may, I think that's the case. But we know from what the telescopes show us that there are billions out there. And uh, wow, when you're looking at that, you're looking at the same kind of network as what's in your brain. Who did that? Oh, hallelujah. Who did that? And it is not, I don't care what everybody else says or tries to tell you, it is not coincidental. It is by intent, design, and purpose. All right, so I think I have some, uh, I have, uh, 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 I can, what, what do I want to say? There you go. This is where you can find this. Franco Vaza Home, this is the web page that I accessed. Quantitative, besides, this is besides the Popular Mechanics article. It'll take you here. And this, these are the guys who did it. Quantitative comparison between the cosmic web and the brain network of neurons. I just would love to be in this laboratory and just watch as these guys put the slide into the microscope and look down. And, and the other guys looking out through the telescope. And they print out pictures and they say, oh no. It's the same. <laughs> hey, there you go. That was worth the price of admission today, right? By itself, wasn't it? You came into church. You got more than you ever thought you'd get, bargained for, and hoped for. But glory to God. We're not ending there. Okay, give me that next picture. Now this I found this week, and I put it on Facebook last night. It doesn't look too bad here, but on Facebook, you can see the, the high-resolution rendering, and you can also, I, I clicked that little button that says make it 3D, so it moves a little bit. Now, I thought Brother Harold had a great take on this. Is this my, the pattern for my new shirt? And yeah, it just about is. But others who have medical backgrounds were zeroing in on the fact that this is cellular. If you look at this on Facebook, and this is really hard to find online, the only place I saw it was LinkedIn, and I'll show you the reference where you can access it in just a moment, but if you see this, it is glorious. This is the highest resolution rendering of a human cell that's ever been provided. Nothing like this has ever been seen before. And when you look at the colors and the shapes, and the connectedness. This is one cell. You cannot look at that and say that this happened accidentally or coincidentally. You cannot. No matter how spiritually blind you are, you cannot look at that in all of its incredible variety of shapes and patterns, designs and colors. And, and it's one thing just to look at it artistically, which I think is incredibly marvelous. But this isn't a picture. I mean, it is. But what this is is a cell that is assigned a specific task in your body and mine so that when I need replenished skin, somehow my body is able to produce a cell that replenishes my skin. Now, it's not doing as good as it used to 30 or 40 years ago. And I don't know what happened to the cells that were producing hair. They quit, gave up, went on strike. I'm not sure. But this, my friend, is cool. Now, I have an, an assignment slide for that, too. So give me that last slide. So this is the, uh, the gal that I found this from, Giulia Rosana Giulino. She's the lead scientist studying inflammation, immunology, and rheumatology. I'm not sure where. And forget what you know about what a cell looks like. This is the most detailed model of a human cell I've ever seen obtained using X-ray, nuclear magnetic resonance, and cryo-electron microscopy data sets. Such a crowded 
cytoplasm. There's your LinkedIn reference for it. Source and credits. She gives credit then to Evan Ingersoll and Gail McGill. And you can, uh, you can do the research if you want to. Go in your Bible now to the book of John, chapter 1. As humans, we are now able to see large things that seem small because they're far away. And we can do this through telescopes. And we're able to see small things that are extremely close but appear to be very large as we look at them through the microscope. And I think you would agree with me today that it is simply amazing what we can see with telescopes and microscopes. When I see that kind of stuff, it just, man, it, it sets me on fire. It's like, wow, how cool is that? How marvelous, how incredibly powerful. Majestic and glorious. But the word shows us another way of seeing. The Greek word for spirit is pneuma. It means breath or wind. Wind of God, breath of God. It applies to the Holy Spirit, the human spirit, pneuma. P-N-E-U-M-A. We get a lot of words from that base root word. But let's add to that pneuma scope. And so the Bible is telling you and I, hey, hallelujah, you just helped me make a new word. The Bible is telling you and I that there are things that we can only see, as we read there from 2 Corinthians, that we can only see some things pneumoscopically. That's all. Now you can put a telescope here and let me look out to the stars. You can put a microscope here and let me look to the cells, but I will not be able to tell you what I'm looking at. There are things, tools, and training that allow you to take those instruments and use them. And so it is with a pneumoscope. So for all of you who are unbelievers who are watching, you scientists and physicists, I, I don't know how you look at that and say that it was by chance or that it was fashioned by some force, but certainly not by an all-creative all-powerful God. John chapter 1, look at verse 18. If you're there today, say amen. Amen. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. Number one, seeing God is the goal. When you read in the Old Testament that so-and-so saw the God of Israel you either have to assume then that Jesus is lying and that would be a wrong, sinful, ungodly assumption, correct? And yet we have to reconcile it that Jesus said, listen, I'm going to tell you right now, no one has ever seen God. No human has ever seen God but the Son. So in the Old Testament, then you have to take it that in every Old Testament appearance of God, we're talking about a pre-incarnate, a before human flesh in the birth appearance of Jesus Christ. Now, if you struggle with that, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Here's what we know. Seeing God is the goal. It's everyone's goal. You and I have been created to see him. You and I have been fashioned to witness to him, to have an experience with him that causes us to, even as humans, as mere mortals living on this tiny little planet, to cry out and declare the glories of God, to lift up the matchless name of the King of glory and say how good is our God. We have been made to see him in every aspect, to see him with our physical body, to see him with our spirit, Spirit to see him and seeing God is always the goal. First Timothy 6:16 Paul says he alone can never die and he lives in light so brilliant that no human can approach him. No human eye has ever seen him nor ever will. All honor and power to him forever. Amen. Wow. So Jesus said I'm telling you right now, no one has ever seen God. Paul comes along and says, I'm going to tell you, not only has no one ever seen him, no one ever will. 
well, pastor, what are we doing? How are we going to go to heaven and see him? I believe we're talking about the essence, the, 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 the substance of God that is so beyond what we can not only imagine, but that what we can even perceive or that we can bring in, even in our glorified state. This is why knowing Jesus is so critical. Because he said to his disciples, when you have seen me, you have seen Mm Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. Seeing God is the goal. We're not aiming for the farthest. We're not aiming for the smallest. We aim for the most glorious. We aim for life. We aim for the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. And when we set our pneumoscope, we are looking into a world that no one else except the believer can see. When we peer through the lens of the pneumoscope, we're seeing things that unbelievers deny exist. But we see them clearly and we know assuredly that they're there as sure as that sky is up there as sure as that cell is in my body that looks like glorious unbelievable artwork that da Vinci could have never conceived of as sure as we look through the pneumoscope we see God and his ability to create and bless govern and guide but those who have never peered in through the pneumoscope have no capacity to see it Then I said, Isaiah, Isaiah said, it's all over. I'm doomed for I'm a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I've seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. When Isaiah saw him, he said, the first thing he thought, you know, we always say, whoa, glory. I can't wait to see the Lord. It's going to be so glorious. When Isaiah saw him, he said, that's it. I'm dead. I'm good as dead. And we see that with others too. I'm thinking of Samson's parents in the Old Testament. The first thought is, how can I be able to be allowed to even exist and have seen that? Just a glimpse of it. And he, he collapses and cries out, I, I can't live. I, there, there's nothing now. There's that fear Uh, of overwhelming death. I don't deserve anything but death. I deserve hell. I deserve to be separated from that which I've seen as far away as is possible, not just humanly, but as far as creatively possible. I I deserve to be away. There's no way I'm going to live, not now, but for eternity I'm dead. So I've seen the Lord. And with a pneumoscope, You will always see the Lord, the King of glory. You always will. That's what it's pointed towards. You know, when when they open those um, planetariums up and the telescope is out, you know, that you always see it's a dome and that thing's always, you know, looking around for new places to point or maybe when the sky, when the earth rotates, they see a different part. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you this the pneumoscope's always pointed in one place. Now, you may move, but it. Its vision, the destination of what it wants to see will never change. You're still stuck on the fact that we create a new word today, huh? Isn't that cool? So you're never going to forget it. And, and now you'll understand you and I will be able to easily process why we see things that people who look at those those slides that I showed those pictures they look right at them and they cannot see what we see they they they're forced to have probably a big angel standing there holding their hand maybe they're right-handed and uh the angel's making them right out it is not possible that this is a co- yes it is a coincidence it's a coincidence it's all it's just random random all kinds of stuff came together boom and these cells came flying out Forces, forces, there's this big bang and then stars were flung out everywhere, just flung everywhere. It's not possible that this is a coincidence. <laughs> I just think, I'm sorry, I think it's hysterical. 
I know the scientific, you and I know about them. We, I don't know personally them, but we know from the books and the articles and the television shows and the famous ones and all the atheists and the, the planetarium people that just go on and on. There is no God. It's all. And then they've got somebody that, that gets this incredible picture and two of them come together and say, well, what are you looking at? I'm looking at this. It's salve, human brain. What are you looking at? I'm looking like at the whole universe as much of it as I can see. Well, let's switch and see what they look like. It's not possible that this is a coincidence. Wouldn't that ruin your day? Huh? You've spent 83 years getting an earned doctorate and being taught by all the leading physicists, and you're, you're just at the top. You're the person most sought after. You know it all. And the guy says, it's just a big brain. <laughs> the question is, whose brain is it? And in that message a few years ago, I told you, we're in the mind of God. Hallelujah. Well, Pastor, the universe is stars. It's not, that's not, you, you're talking about neural networks and everything in our brain. That, you don't see blood moving through. Listen, you and I don't know what we're looking at. We're just, we're a speck on a speck in a speck of a, in a uh, solar system, in a galaxy that's a speck in the universe. We don't know what we know. Is that our pneumoscope is pointed towards him. And when we look through the word of God, do you understand that how critical it is that this is the lens that you and I look through? There is no other way. Go now to John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and look at verse 3. Jesus replied, he's in this conversation, as you know, with Nicodemus. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, we often interpret that to mean you cannot receive it, you cannot get to it. But I want to use it today in its rawest English sense. Unless you have been born again, you cannot see through the pneumoscope. You cannot you can pick this Bible up and you can read it as a historic document and you will not see. You can pick it up and read it as a collection of great tradition and history gathered by men down through the ages, but you will not see. This thing is alive and you cannot come into it and receive that life until you are born again. Number two today, the new life is the lens. The new life. Now the new life in today's message is almost synonymous with the Word of God. The Word of God is synonymous with Jesus Christ. And so what I'm telling you is that just saying yes to him is only one aspect of the lens. It's all of that together. It's him and his death and burial and resurrection from what they did to him on the cross. It's his ascension to heaven and his second coming for you and I. But it's also you and I being convicted by the Holy Spirit, recognizing how far away we are because of our own unrighteousness and our unwillingness to heal, and then coming to him, bowing and saying, Saying, I'm wrong. You're right. You're scientists, physicists, nuclear physicists, those of you who helped find these kinds of pictures and, and have looked into the human cell and the most incredible awesome renderings that, that humans have ever seen. Those of you who have peered out into the starry skies and captured pictures for us, but still you deny the existence of God. Listen, you can, you can have all kinds of reasons. You can say, I don't want to. You can say, I haven't seen it. You can say, it's not there. You can say whatever you want. That's your choice. But the truth is, it's available. But you don't come there through church. You don't come there through denomination. You don't come there through the printed Bible, you come there through repentance and you have to say, I've never seen you, God. I can't see you. Even if I had a way, I would not be able to look at you because of how holy you are, but I recognize how unholy I am and I ask you to forgive me. That's how you see. And apart from that, there is no other way. There aren't three ways to see. There aren't multiple avenues of religion. Well, you know, I'm pretty much a Buddhist. I'm a Hindu. I'm a, uh, I'm a Muslim. I'm a, listen, no, there's one way to see through the pneumoscope, and his name is Jesus Christ. There's no other way. 
turn the power on takes the Holy Spirit. To fire this thing up takes you engaging and understanding that God's word is eternal and it cannot change. Uh, you can look at those kinds of pictures and you can disagree and say, well, those, those particular physicists are from a certain camp and they really don't have the latest uh, renderings in front of them. They don't understand all the data. They've misinterpreted. Oh, yeah, we've heard it all, blah, 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 blah. But it's funny. For 2,000 years now, I'm talking New Testament age, but we really could reach back into the Old Testament as well and say for several, maybe four plus thousand years, every single person who has come to the Almighty God, the creator of the universe, the God and Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that every human who has knelt down and said, I am wrong and you are right, I repent, please forgive me, every single one of us had begun to see the same thing instantly. Instantly. Now that, my friend, is beyond a coincidence. Pastor, I'm having trouble processing all this. Man, I just ate so much turkey, you wouldn't believe it. I'm just struggling today. I got it. I got it. But we're laying down a marker here for a lot of folks out there that think they're smarter than God, that they've got more insight than God. That they don't need God because they got mad at him when they were 12 years old. And bless God, they're never going to show, they're never coming back. They're mad. They're going to show God how mad they are. And I want to invite you. Go ahead, take the path of Steve Jobs. Take it, take that path. Mad as a kid. Because he perceived God as uncaring about the dying around the world. And walked out of church never to go back in. Take that path. But I'm telling you, there is a world that you can see if you want to, but you don't set the terms. You don't make the guidelines. God has already established those. He gave the key, Jesus Christ. He provided the lens, Jesus Christ, the word of God. There aren't five lenses. You don't change them in and out. There's one lens, one pneumoscope, and one vision when you look through it. The glory of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, the glory of God. You and I aren't seeing church. We're not seeing angels when we look into his word and we pray and communicate with God and we worship. We are seeing the glory of God, the God of creation, the God who loves us and does for us on a second-by-second -second basis. Hallelujah. All right. Isaiah 6 goes on. Verse 5, he says, I've seen the king. How am I not going to die? But listen to 6 and 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, see. And there's a comma there in the New Living. This coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. We always read that to mean that Isaiah, you can now... See that your sins have been forgiven. I want to read it differently today. When the coal touched his lips, he got the pneumoscope. See, now, now, Isaiah, now you can see. Now you'll be able to look and see what others cannot see. Now you'll have vision that I want you to have. When that coal touched his lips, the angel said, see, look, see, observe. And that's what Jesus Christ does for you and I. He is the fulfillment of that for every son and daughter of his. He comes to us and by the power of the Holy Spirit, when we receive new life, suddenly we're able to hear that word from heaven. See, 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 like you've never seen before. See and marvel not because you're looking at a higher resolution rendering of the human cell, not because you're observing part of the universe through an artist idea of a compilation, but see because you're looking through God's word and you're seeing what the fallen man cannot see. You're seeing what God has intended for you to see and no one else. Glory to God. Number one, Seeing God is the goal. And when I say that, I mean eternal life. Hallelujah. Eternal life. 
When I say that, I mean being able to cry out in a time of desperation and you're praying for healing, you're praying for deliverance, you're praying for prosperity, whatever it is that you're praying for, that's because you're trying to see God. You're not just wanting money. You want God to provide so that you can testify to his goodness. That's seeing with a pneumoscope. Number two, the new life is the lens. Whether scientist, physicist, atheist, humanist, and all others, you cannot see pneumoscopically until you repent of your pride and receive the lordship of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Every one of us have come to the same place in life. You think because many of us came from poor or humble places in life, that we just didn't know better, if we had access to the technology that you have, if we could see through the scopes that you see through. But we're telling you that if you look through the scope we look through, and you have permission to do that, my friend. As a matter of fact, you have an invitation written by the hand of God and sealed with the blood of Jesus Christ, his son. If you'll look through that scope, you will begin to see what all of us have seen and what we continue to see every day. The love of God. He will take you places that you never imagined. He will rescue you from places you never thought you'd escape. He'll guide you each day. And he's promised to bring you and I home safely. Hallelujah. And the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal. He had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips and said, see. Isaiah 6, 6, and 7. Go back to John now, or maybe you're still there. Look at chapter 6. This is our final thing this morning. John chapter 6, and look at verse 40. For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son, glory to God, and believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. (laughs) Everywhere I turn when I'm around believers, Eventually, the conversation gets to this. You think Jesus is coming back soon? And sometimes I wonder if we have created some of the atmosphere of anxiety in our nation because we have become, we have access now to such technology. We have access to the media and the message of parts of what you see through the pneumoscope is prevalent. Now, the unbeliever, the unseeing, are trying to paint us as those who are deceived, who are misguided, perhaps even mentally unstable, because we keep talking about this. But I want to tell you again, it's because we're looking through a scope that you are not looking through. It does not surprise us that after your years and years and years of education and your advanced degrees and your incredible background of training and knowledge and expertise, it does not surprise us that on a day in 2020, you had to look into those instruments, one through a telescope and one through a microscope, and say, this is not a coincidence. We knew that. We've been telling you that for 2,000 years. You can paint us into a corner and say, you're crazy. But we don't say to you how mentally unstable you are because you're looking through some telescope and trying to figure out the whole cosmos by looking at one planet. We respect and admire the work you do and appreciate it when it's not political, but just simply science. It's amazing. It's incredible when you can show us the human cell like that and it's beyond anything we could have ever imagined. It's just delightful. We rejoice in that. But don't you dare think that God is going to forever turn a blind eye to you mocking us for looking through the only scope that matters. Number three today, resurrection is our reward. 
For all who see, Jesus said, for it is my Father's will. You can't see him. You never will see him, Paul said. But it, now that doesn't mean we won't be in his presence, that we won't be around him. We will, hallelujah. And I know what Revelation says, that God, throne of God comes down. I got it. I don't know how you reconcile all that. All I know is Jesus and Paul said, I'm telling you, there's something about the essence of God, the, the, the personhood of God that you cannot see. It's just... It's too marvelous, too beyond. It, he's God. So thank the Lord the Bible says that about him. Amen. But in spite of that, for it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. Well, praise God. Oh, it doesn't end there. I will raise them up at the last day. So when we look through the pneumoscope, we keep trying to see Jesus coming our way. Sometimes we even want him in the telescopes to look for him. Is it out there? Do you see it? Is the return come? How about the new city, Holy Jerusalem? Do you see it coming down? It's a big cube. Maybe you can see it with the telescope. But we, we know that we're looking through this pneumoscope and God is saying to us he's coming soon and we get excited hallelujah but pastor we're in the midst of a pandemic and here in our area it has gripped us like unbelievable even I guess it was the New York Times the other day had Cumberland in one of the articles uh, us places like El Paso Texas and I don't know there were other countries that were being applauded for how wonderfully they were handling the virus. Turkey was one in particular. The authoritarian nature of their government allowed them to lock down and to protect their population. Today we found out that they were actually cooking the books on the numbers. And so the government switched those numbers and they went from being one of the, quote, safest by number, safest place. Now this is how <laughs> sometimes you can have the media and the re reports, and then you have reality. And so they were a number that represented safest place in all of Europe. Today, just three days later, they're the most dangerous place <laughs> for, for uh, con contracting the virus in all of Europe. And nothing changed except how they report the numbers. So we have to be careful. We understand that we're in the middle of a very contagious virus. I've been aware of that since January, February. We know that this thing is incredibly dangerous. But as we look through the scope that God has given us, we know that resurrection is our reward. From Isaiah 62, the Lord has sent this message to every land. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your Savior is coming. Glory. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. They will be called the holy people and the people redeemed by the Lord. And Jerusalem will be known as a desirable place and the city no longer forsaken. I'm never sure how those who believe there's no rapture of the church prior to the tribulation, how they deal with verses like this, but I guess they think we go up, and then we meet Jesus and we turn right around and come back with him. Because this verse tells you and I, these verses, that he will bring the daughter of Zion with him. He's bringing the church with him. The people of God are coming with him. Hallelujah. When he comes, we'll already be with him. Thank God. At the end of the tribulation, you and I will not be joining the army. We're already in the army. Hallelujah. At the end, we won't have to try and figure out what it is to move around in these glorified bodies. We'll have had seven years practicing. We'll know exactly what to do, how to our horse what is going to happen in the head of us we'll know it all because we've been with the king of glory and when he returns we're going to be with him John said the armies which were in heaven followed on white horses and that's you and I amen he picks that up from Isaiah Isaiah 62 11 and 12 is the reference for that number one seeing God is the goal number two the new life is the lens and number three resurrection is our reward it really is Always has been, always will be. It's the reward. Nothing here. I don't care how many prayers God answers for us, how many miracles we see, healings. I don't care how many times he doesn't heal when we want him to, or he doesn't provide the finances that we thought we needed. What I know is he has promised resurrection to every son and every daughter. And Jesus is coming soon. When I look through my pneumoscope, I know that the time is short. And so I say to all of you who are 
not looking, not able to see. Don't run out of time. There is a day coming. Has not arrived for 2,000 years. I have no idea why. Do I think God is late? Absolutely. I think Jesus should have been back years, decades ago. If I had my way, that's how it would have played out. Didn't have my way. Seems like I never do. But I'm so glad I get his way. And when you look through the scope of the Spirit, you're going to be reminded that not only is Jesus coming, but he's coming for you. He's washed you. He's sanctified you. He's given you his Holy Spirit. And his resurrection power dwells inside of you. In John chapter 20, you don't have to turn there. But in John chapter 20, this is what I think is the most critical thing in verse 29. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Do you know what he's saying there? There were those who saw him physically as he lived here on the earth among us. Compared to the generations since, it was an incredibly small percentage of humans that saw him physically. And he's responding to the disciples here, Thomas in particular, who said, I cannot believe until not only do I see the scars, but I touch them. And when he touches the scars in that glorified body of Jesus, that resurrected body, he cries out, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says, yeah, you're blessed. You've touched my body. But more blessed are those who do not see me physically, but are able to see through the scope. Now for all of us who would wish we were there when Jesus was alive on earth, we need to quit wishing that because the greater blessing is for those of us alive now. When you and I see him, but only through the scope. Bow your hearts with me this morning, please. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for new life, resurrection life, eternal life. Thank you for godly life, for all that we have access to because of Jesus Christ. God, thank you that you cannot be seen by human eye. Thank you. But thank you that you did not leave us blind. You did not leave us without an instrument, a precise instrument for seeing the living God. And we're able to look through that pneumoscope and see what is beyond description, to see what is beyond explanation, to see what is beyond celebration. It's so incredible. It takes our breath away. So incredible. There aren't words to describe. It's so incredible. It causes us to be paralyzed and stand or bow or fall in place and say, oh God, I deserve death. I deserve hell. I deserve to be separated from you eternally. You are too glorious. But then that hand reaches out and says, see, Jesus has touched you. Your heads are bowed for just a moment. I invite you here in the building. I invite you watching. Come on, I, I feel so passionate about this, this moment of evangelism, this opportunity for you to become a visionary, to see, to really see. Thank God for microscopes and telescopes. Thank God for technology and medicine and medical advances. Thank God for the vaccine that may arrive soon, but thank God for Jesus Christ and the ability to see because of eternal life. If you've never received him, if you've never bowed, come on, those of you in America, you know, you've had opportunities, many of them. Do not, do not pass up this one. It may very well be your last one. For those of you overseas in other nations across Asia and Pakistan, for those of you in Latin America, 
and around the world, maybe you have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ before, the good news that I shared with you from his word today, but I'm here to tell you that he forgives sins. He welcomes sinners into his presence. That's the love of God. No other God, no other pretender offers that, but he he offers it. He also authenticated it. He made sure you and I would know it was real. It's not fake news because Jesus Christ came. His only son lived among us. He was sinless. He performed miracles, healings, raised the dead, and fed the multitudes. In spite of all of that, they crucified the sinless one, the King of Israel. Put him on a cross. Made sure he was dead, took him down, buried him, put him in a tomb for three days, had guards surrounding it. But on that third day, they found out he was already gone. Resurrection power came into that place. Death could not hold him. That's God saying this is not fake news. This is the real deal. And when you receive him, you begin to look through a scope that scientists don't have unless they're believers. You begin to look through a scope that physicists can't see through. It's the scope of the Holy Spirit. It begins with you saying to the Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me. You might say, but I want to see him first. It does not work that way. I want him to talk to me first. It does not work that way. I cannot even believe there is a God like this. That is not acceptable. You do not have to believe. You have to repent. You cannot see him. It does not matter. You repent. You say, God, I cannot see you, but I trust what I've heard. I've trust from your word today. I heard it and I obey. I surrender my pride. I ask you to take it from me. I surrender my pride and say, would you please forgive me? And when you do that, friend, you begin to say, God, I'm so sorry. Brokenness comes. And instead of stuff coming out, yes, there may be tears, grieving and sorrow. But the brokenness in you is not happening so that stuff can come out. It's happening so that someone can come in. And that someone is Jesus Christ. And when he comes in, you will never be the same. Jesus will be living through you. Father, we thank you this morning for the power and presence of our God. Thank you for your word, which encourages us. Thank you, Lord, for the scope, the pneumoscope that we can look through because we are believers. We see things we could not imagine and how we thank you for it. I pray your blessing on brothers and sisters in this room today and who are watching from their room online. I pray for the men and women of God that they will be touched, that angels will stand guard, stand watch round about us. Lord, that we will be defended as this virus sweeps through the nations of the world. I pray that we will be helped, Lord, even when we might contract the virus. Give us your strength. Speak into us your encouragement. Breathe into us your life. Touch doctors and nurses who are weary from dozens or hundreds of days on duty. Lord, help us. And we give you the praise and the thanksgiving for it in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Come on, stand with me this morning, church, if you're able to. Brother Ricky is going to lead us in a chorus this morning as we close out. If you want special prayer, you know this altar's open. I'll pray for you. I I try to be, it's a fine line to walk. I don't want to over-encourage you to uh, come to the altar and have you feel like if you don't, You're disappointing me. You are not. I want you to feel absolutely safe, but I also want you to have to receive prayer if you'd like it. Those of you who've been watching and when you get home, this is a uh, an evangelistic message. I preached on evangelists a few weeks ago, and I felt the Holy Spirit leading me to some things that are just evangelistic. You need to uh, you need to share this and let some people find Jesus through this. The altar's open. Brother Ricky's going to lead us. I love you guys. No Wednesday night. I'll see you online, okay?